Good afternoon, Southminster scholars. Well, today is the trial of Louis Rael, a man I had never heard of. Well, just who was he? And why should a trial of him be of any big deal? He was born in 1844 in the Canadian Red River frontier. He would become a powerful politician and a force in the province of Manitoba. Being part native Canadian, he also became the political leader of the Métis people of the vast Canadian prairie, somewhat similar to the Sioux and the Comanches in this nation. He would lead these people in two rebellions against the Canadian government's increasing encroachment on lands reserved by treaty for the Métis. He would be defeated, tried, and executed for high treason. He would become perhaps the most controversial figure in Canadian history. His life and uh, deeds have spawned a vast and massive um, diverse literature. He sought to preserve Métis rights and culture as their homelands were being swept away by civilization. Over the decades, he was made into a folk hero. He has received more scholarly attention than any other figure in Canadian history. At his trial, he would resist his lawyer's arguments of being not guilty by reason of insanity. Instead, Rael defended his own actions and affirmed the rights of the Métis people. He would declare, Life without dignity is not worth living. It's a complicated story, as most great trials are, and I'm going to turn it over to Professor Linder. But in it, watch for Ryle's study for the priesthood, but stopping short of ordination. Watch for the Hudson Bay Company preparing to sell a massive swath of land it had claimed during fur trading days. This was huge. <laughs> Present day provinces of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. When the Métis people were not even taken into consideration, watch for Rael organizing the Métis into a ragtag army of rebellion. Watch for his establishing a provisional government with himself as president. Watch for open rebellion, which resulted in the execution of one of the Anglos trying to overthrow Riel and restore the lands to the Canadian government. A hot-headed Anglo racist named Thomas Scott. We'll hear more about him. Watch for the settlement that created the new province of Manitoba, granting the Métis substantial local autonomy and 1.4 million acres for their use. Watch for the election of Rael to the Parliament of Canada, despite an outstanding warrant for his arrest for inciting rebellion. Watch for Ryle's banishment from Canada for five years, which led to a vision. Ryle claimed God had appointed him as prophet of a new world, and that he was the voice of the Mati, the people now favored by God. Watch for the twists and turns that would result in Ryle returning to Manitoba and leading what would be called the Great Northwest Rebellion. The Métis, badly outnumbered, were shortly forced to surrender. But Brayel turned himself over to trial willingly, believing a public trial might draw attention to the plight of his people. Watch for the five-day trial, the ins and outs of whether Brayel was sane. Despite his insistence, he was mentally competent. Finally, Watch for the outcome. The jury would deliberate for only one hour, but the foreman would be crying when he announced the verdict to the judge.
Few Americans know about the 1885 trial of Canada's Louis Riel. Partly this is because Americans are woefully ignorant about the history of our neighbors to the north. But nearly every Canadian knows about the Riel trial. It is of great symbolic importance to Canadians. And more than that, it is a trial that significantly shaped the history of the country. In the 1800s, Louis Riel became the charismatic leader of the Matisse. The Matisse are the mixed-race descendants of unions between, most often, French or British men and women from the Cree, Ojibwe, and other native peoples. In the 19th century, the Matisse lived mostly in areas where there was considerable racial mixing due to the fur trade. They developed a distinct culture in central and western Canada. Among the Matisse, there was an important distinction between French Matisse, born usually of boys or fathers, and the Anglo Matisse with English or Scottish fathers. The French Matisse spoke French, practiced Catholicism, and generally led the nomadic life of hunters or trappers. The English spoke, the English Matisse spoke English, were Protestants, and generally lived on farms. Riel was French Matisse, with a father of Franco-Ojibwe descent and a white mother. By modern standards, the 1885 Northwest Rebellion, which Louis Riel led, seems no big deal. Canadian forces easily put down the uprising of a couple hundred Matisse settlers along the South Saskatchewan River. A majority of Matisse in the region did not participate in the fighting. Only a hundred or so persons died in the conflict. The importance of the Northwest Rebellion and the trial of Louis Riel comes from its symbolism and the tensions they reveal. Tensions that continue to distinguish Canada, East versus West, Native versus non-Native, and French-speaking versus English-speaking. At the same time, both the rebellion and Riel's trial should be understood as the product of a particular place and time. The place was the Canadian frontier, and the time was one of conflict between European civilization and the traditions of an indigenous people. Riel might be the most complicated, elusive, puzzling, and controversial figure in Canadian history. A look at the chapter titles of Albert Braze's 2003 book, The False Traitor, Louis Riel in Canadian Culture, suggests the many and disparate ways in which Riel has been seen. The Red River Patriot, the traitor, the martyr, the go-between, the mystic madman. Riel was born in 1844 into a devout Catholic family in a settlement on the Red River in present-day Winnipeg. Although of seven-eighths white ancestry, Riel considered himself a Matisse. He left home at the age of 14 to travel to Montreal and study for the priesthood. He proved to be a serious and gifted student. He struck his masters as faithful and scholarly, but they found him somber and a bit odd and reclusive. Ten years later, when his widowed mother begged him to return home, Riel left Montreal. On his way back in 1868, Riel stayed for several months in St. Paul. There he heard stories from Matisse traders of growing unrest in the settlements north of the border along the Red River. The cause of the unrest was a land deal. The Hudson's Bay Company was getting rail ready to sell a massive swath of land it owned to Canada. Called Rupert's Land, the swath included present-day Manitoba and Saskatchewan. The land had been granted to the company in 1670 by the King of England. Of course, native people who lived on the land might have begged to differ about whether the land was really the king's to grant in the first place. When a Canadian survey team showed up, local residents worried about how the land transfer might affect their independent lifestyle. Riel, now back in his mother's cottage, took up the Matisse cause. His English language skills, which were rare among French-speaking Matisse in the area, made him well-suited to the task. Riel persuaded the surveyors to abandon their mission. Then he sought to unite the French and English-speaking mixed-race people of the area. Riel stressed their common grievances with Eastern interests. And Riel was a man of action. He helped create a local army to oppose the appointment of William McDougall as the new lieutenant governor to run the Red River settlement. 
Riel's message resonated, and he took the offensive. His ragtag army seized a fort on the Red River owned by the Hudson's Bay Company. The fort, named Fort Gary, fell without bloodshed. Next, Riel formed a provisional government with himself as the president. Matisse in the region cheered Riel's efforts, but most white Canadians considered Riel's actions outrageous. Whites plotted to retake Fort Gary, but Riel's government got wind of it. They arrested the plotters. One of the men arrested was Thomas Scott, a hot-headed racist from Ontario. After his arrest, Scott taunted his captors relentlessly. After having all they could take, Riel's government court-martialed Scott. He was convicted and executed by a firing squad. Now, Scott's killing and the outrage it caused became the central and defining event of the Red River resistance. With it, hope of compromise went out the window. The execution prompted Prime Minister John A. Macdonald to order troops west to regain control of the region. Riel's provisional governmental army proved no match against the Canadian forces, who easily retook Fort Garry. In June 1870, an agreement was reached. Under the agreement, a new province to be called Manitoba would be established, and it would have substantial local autonomy. The agreement guaranteed settlers the right to retain their land and set aside an additional 1.4 million acres within the province for future Matisse possession. The agreement did not include, however, the amnesty that Riel thought he had been promised. Riel, who flood fled just hours before the advancing troops reached the fort, found a $5,000 bounty on his head, so he cooled his heels for a while in the United States. Over the next several years, Riel slipped in and out of Canada, but wherever he stayed, he remained committed to Matisse politics. In 1873, even with an outstanding warrant for his arrest, Riel won election to the Canadian Parliament. When he showed up in Ottawa to claim his seat, his fellow members voted to immediately expel him. In 1874, while hiding in Montreal, Riel won the Manitoba seat in Parliament a second time. Groundhog's Day, fellow legislators again expelled Riel. Still, that didn't stop Manitoba voters from electing him to Parliament yet a third time. Finally, legislators tired of dealing with the sticky political mess. Riel was just too popular back in Manitoba. So Parliament voted in 1875 to grant amnesty for all the participants in the Red River Uprising. In Riel's case, however, the amnesty came with a condition. Riel must agree to a five-year banishment from Canada. Riel's banishment led to a turning point in his life. It occurred in Washington, D.C., where Riel had come to meet with President Grant to discuss the plight of the Matisse people. Shortly after visiting with the president, Riel experienced a vision. In it, God anointed him as prophet of the new world. No longer did Riel see himself as an exiled and failed political leader. He saw himself now as the voice for a people favored by God, the Matisse. Riel's vision raised questions about his mental health, and so did many of his other actions. He told people he was the biblical King David. He developed a propensity for ripping his clothes off. And to those who asked about his nudism, Riel told them that the body was beautiful. Look, he said, Adam and Eve were comfortable with nudity before the first sin. Friends worried about Riel's tendency to cry and shout in public, or the fact that he gave $1,000 to a blind beggar, or that he interrupted a mass to contradict a priest. Just a year into his five-year banishment, concerned friends secretly took Riel to Quebec, and there Riel's uncle placed him in a mental institution near Montreal under an assumed name. But his mental condition continued to deteriorate, on one occasion, he smashed ornaments and candles in the asylum's chapel. Several times, orderlies had to place Riel in a straitjacket. 
Manitoba, meanwhile, was undergoing a rapid evolution. The province was becoming more English and less French. It was becoming more dependent on rail and steamboats than the old Red River carts. Its hunting and fur trading economy was giving way to farming. Matisse, intent upon preserving their traditional lifestyle, looked west to Saskatchewan, and several thousand Matisse migrated to lands along the Saskatchewan River. Eventually, Riel's health improved enough to allow him discharge from the asylum. He traveled through the northern United States and Manitoba before settling in Montana in late 1879. There he found work as a trader selling goods to Indians and Matisse at Fort Benton in the Missouri River country. His experience as a trader made Riel worry about the future of his race. In his letters, he expressed bitter disappointment with, quote, the half-breed who spends most of his earnings on whiskey. Alcohol, Riel believed, led to poverty and drove people away from their farms. So Riel launched an effort to prevent the sale of alcohol to Matisse, but too many people benefited economically from the liquor trade, and the effort failed. By the spring of 1883, Riel was married with two children and a new American citizen. He landed a teaching job at the Catholic Mission of St. Peter's on Montana's Sun River. Riel enjoyed teaching, but the job paid poorly. And worse, the long hours did not allow him to pursue his true interests in religion, poetry, and politics. Back in Saskatchewan, meanwhile, things were not going well for the Matisse. Canadian government surveyors were redrawing plots on the land that the Matisse had settled. Most disturbingly, the surveyors divided the land into square lots. Traditionally, Matisse lived on lots that were long rectangles, bordering rivers. The Matisse system allowed more Matisse farmers river access, and it made it possible to have homes close together along the riverfront. Anger over these land issues reached the boiling point in the summer of 1884, and the Matisse chose to send a delegation to travel to Montana. The delegation's mission convinced the only man who could save their cause to come back to Canada. Riel was expecting them. A month earlier, he had received a letter from Matisse friends that said, the whole race is calling on you. The Matisse delegation pleaded with Riel. We need you, they said. We need you to advocate for better treatment for the Matisse. Riel accepted the call. He packed up and headed north to the small river town of Batoche. Once there, he busied himself drafting and sending to Ottawa a petition for of grievances for both White and the Matisse residents. The government basically brushed him off. It offered only a few minor concessions that did nothing to reduce the agitation. By 1885, March of 1885, Riel felt radical action was necessary. So he called a meeting in a local church. And in the meeting, he asked for a vote on setting up a provisional government, which Riel proposed to call the Ex Ovidate, from Latin meaning out of the flock. He told the crowd that the time had come to take up arms against the Canadian government. He had another announcement as well. In the new government, there would be a new church under a new pope, Bishop Bourget of Montreal. Rial told his followers that God would help the members of his flock. They were the new chosen people. And he then performed a ritual in which he breathed the Holy Spirit into each person who declared support for his cause. But back east, authorities were not amused. The first violence of the 1885 Northwest Rebellion erupted when a Matisse party on a mission to a general store encountered two Mounties. The Matisse rebels chased the two Mounties as they raced to rejoin their unit. And as the Matisse band fired shots over their heads, the Mounties retreated. More recruits joined the rebels in time for a second encounter with Mounties near Duck Lake. And when the rebels met the Mounties, the Mounties drew their sleighs into a defensive circle. Two rebels approached the Mounties under a white flag. But things didn't work out well. 
The Mounties fatally shot both men. And this ignited a firefight that left 12 Mounties and five rebels dead. With the casualties, Riel had crossed a line. Whatever small hope there might have been to achieve a compromise and concessions was gone. When word of the violence reached Prime Minister MacDonald, he ordered 2,000 troops west. They would travel over the still uncompleted rail lines of the Canadian Pacific. And here's just a word about those rail lines. In 1885, large gaps still existed in the railroad between Toronto and the Canadian West. The troops sent by MacDonald traveled by foot and sleigh from one segment to the other. Some historians have attributed MacDonald's non-responsiveness to Matisse's complaints to his interest in building support among the public to finish the rail line. Support the troops, build the railroad. For people who buy this conspiracy theory, Riel died to save a railroad, a railroad that now stretches from sea to shining sea. At any rate, by rail and other means, the Canadian troops, led by Major General Frederick Middleton, made it to within 170 miles of Batoche when they learned that nine whites had been massacred at Frog Lake earlier in the month. Tensions were sky high. The troops encountered their first fighting near Fish Creek, where Middleton was marching his men north towards Batoche. About 200 rebels hid in a ravine, hoping to ambush the soldiers as they passed through. But a scout foiled the plan when he spotted the rebels in the woods. The Canadian troops moved to higher ground, and from there they could fire down into the woods at the rebels. When the fighting was over, six Canadian soldiers were dead and another 49 wounded. The rebels lost four men and dozens of horses. That climatic battle between the badly outnumbered rebels and Middleton's troops occurred on May 9th near the rebel-held ta town of Batoche. Knowing that rebels were pinned down and low on ammunition, General Middleton was content to let the fighting drag on for days. When it finally became apparent that the rebels' ammunition was all but gone, the troops charged. Many rebels, including Riel, fled into the woods in face of the advancing troops. But three days later, understanding that his cause was now hopeless, Riel surrendered. He hoped that a public trial might draw attention to the struggle of the Matisse people for justice. Meeting his enemy captive for the first time, Middleton described Riel as a mild-spoken and mild-looking man with a short brown beard and an uneasy, frightened look about his eyes, which gradually disappeared as I talked to him. An escort of 16 soldiers transferred Real, transported Riel to the police barracks at Regina. Inspector Richard Dean, concerned about a flood of journalists and Matisse sympathizers showing up at his barracks, order that no one could visit Riel without a letter from the Prime Minister. He also ordered Riel to carry a ball and chain whenever he entered the yard for fresh air or exercise. In the eight weeks before his trial, Riel occupied himself writing religious poetry, letters to relatives and friends, and notes about his religious and political movement. Riel pled not guilty to the charge of wickedly, maliciously, and traitorously making war against Our Lady the Queen, and maliciously and traitorously attempting by force and arms to subvert and destroy the constitution and government of this realm. The treason charges rested on the three Matisse battles with the government. Impressive teams of lawyers were assembled for both sides. A 60-year-old Toronto barrister named Christopher Robinson headed the prosecution for the Crown. The defense was led by a 35-year-old Quebec criminal attorney, Francois Xavier Lemieux, who later became the Chief Justice of Quebec. Assisting Lemieux was Charles Fitzpatrick, who later served as Chief Justice of Canada. Given their client's central role in the rebellion, defense lawyers had little choice but to adopt an insanity strategy. They could point to plenty of evidence showing Riel to be psychologically troubled and maybe a megalomaniac. Riel, after all, told 
anyone who had listened that he was the new world's prophet. The problem for the defense in the insanity case was proving to six jurors that the defendant's mental condition was such that he could not appreciate the wrongfulness of his illegal conduct. Defense lawyers lined up religious leaders and medical experts who could support an insanity defense. They also prepared a brief arguing that Canadian law did not allow a capital case to be decided by a mere six jurors. On July 28, 1885, the trial opened in a makeshift courtroom created in the rented offices of a Regina Land Company. Judge Hugh Richardson rejected each of the contentions in the defense brief, including the argument based on the six-person jury. The prosecution put on the stand a series of government witnesses who described the leading role Riel had played in the rebellion. John Willoughby testified about Riel's vision of a new government of God-fearing citizens. Thomas McKay told jurors that Riel described the Canadian government as a curse and urged armed action against it. Thomas Jackson told of Riel giving battle orders. The defense did little to contradict this testimony. Instead, defense lawyers limited cross-examination to questions designed to elicit admissions that Riel was behaving strangely. The prosecution's star witness was Charles Nolan. Nolan was a cousin of Riel and formerly one of his closest associates. He testified that Riel hoped to sow the seeds that would eventually break Canada into a number of separate countries, each to be governed by a distinct ethnic group. Until Nolan testified, Riel sat passively at the defense table, but suddenly he became agitated. He leaped to his feet and demanded the opportunity to put questions directly to Nolan. Now that got Riel's attorney, Charles Fitzpatrick, on his feet. Fitzpatrick begged the court not to allow his client to question the witness. He worried that a skillful cross-examination by his client would undermine the insanity defense. Riel told the court that the insanity defense was not one of his choosing, quote, if you will allow me, your honor, this case comes to be extraordinary. And while the crown with the great talents that they have in its service are trying to show I am guilty, my counselors are trying to show that I am insane. The argument between Riel and his defense attorney ended only when Judge Richardson explained to Riel the consequence of his asserting his right to cross-examination. It could mean the effective loss of services of his lawyers for all aspects of his case. The defense began its case on the third day of trial. Two priests testified about Riel's peculiar visions and his religious beliefs. Both priests told jurors that they thought Riel was mad. When the defense tried to question the priests about reasons for Matisse's dissatisfaction with Ottawa, the government objected. The prosecution successfully argued that Matisse's complaints, however justified, could not excuse armed action. The issue, they said, was irrelevant in a treason trial. The defense ended its case by calling two expert medical witnesses. One was Dr. Francois Roy, superintendent of the notorious asylum located near Montreal, where Riel had spent nearly two years as an inmate. Roy testified that Riel suffered from megalomania and was clearly of an unsound mind. And the second medical witness was Dr. Daniel Clark, superintendent of the more respected Toronto asylum. Dr. Clark told the jury that he believed Riel had been insane ever since 1865 when he wrote a letter suggesting that he was not really Louis Riel, but a Jew. Testimony ended with the calling of rebuttal witnesses by the prosecution, each of whom recounted conversations with Riel that convinced them that he was not insane. Closing arguments in the case of the Queen versus Louis Riel stand among the most eloquent ever delivered in a Canadian courtroom. Charles Fitzpatrick for the defense began his presentation with a short history of the conflict 
offered both praise to the young volunteers who headed west to put down the rebellion and sympathy for the Matisse and the grievances that they felt with the Canadian government. Mostly, however, Fitzpatrick laid out the evidence of Riel's insanity, which he argued removed him from moral responsibility for his actions. Riel followed Fitzpatrick, but only after disclaimers of responsibility for his statements by his own attorneys. Riel delivered a political speech detailing the grievances of his people. In Riel's version of events, armed rebellion was an act of self-defense. The treason, if there was any, was on the part of the government. Riel worked hard to find the right English words for his story, but spoke for over an hour. Finally, Judge Richardson interrupted. Are you done? And a few minutes later, he was. Christopher Robinson closed for the Crown. Robinson argued the evidence of Riel's guilt was overwhelming. He emphasized Nolan's testimony that Riel would have abandoned his cause and returned to Montana had only the government been willing to pay him a $35,000 bribe to do so. The prosecutor pointed out that's not the sort of decision a visionary madman would make. The jury of six men deliberated Riel's fate for an hour and filed back into the courtroom. The jury foreman, crying like a baby, announced the verdict. Guilty, he said, and then he added, Your Honor, I have been asked by my brother jurors to recommend the prisoner to the mercy of the Crown. Later, one of the jurors wrote a letter to a member of Parliament expressing his mixed feelings about the verdict that he had helped render. Had the government done their duty and redressed the grievances of the half-breeds of Saskatchewan, there would never have been a second Real Rebellion, and consequently no prisoner to try and condemn. Judge Richardson, however, was not in a merciful mood. He declared that Riel had let loose the floodgates of rapine and bloodshed. He found no excuse whatever for his treason and sentenced Riel to be hanged by the neck till you are dead. Riel's lawyers appealed to the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench. The court unanimously rejected every defense argument. Chief Justice Walbridge found the evidence concerning Riel's willingness to abandon the cause for $35,000, especially telling on the issue of insanity. In my opinion, this shows he was willing and quite capable of parting with this illusion if he got $35,000. A final appeal to the Judicial Committee in London was even less successful. The committee found the grounds for appeal too weak to even justify full argument. Prime Minister MacDonald was determined to proceed with the execution despite widespread opposition in Quebec. Riel must hang, though every dog in Quebec bark in his favor, the Prime Minister declared. MacDonald believed, as did many English-speaking Canadians, that Riel exploited the Matisse to serve his own grandiose visions. He blamed Riel for complicating a difficult transition period in Canadian history. Despite his strong feelings about Riel's guilt, MacDonald did appoint a commission of two doctors to evaluate Riel and prepare a report on his mental state. The report was equivocal. Riel had well-marked symptoms of a kind of insanity, but at the same time was quite sensible and capable of distinguishing right from wrong. For MacDonald, that latter concession was quite enough. A date for the execution was set. On the night before his execution, Riel prayed, wrote letters, thanked jailers, and forgave his enemies. For his final request, he asked only an extra three eggs for breakfast. Shortly after 8 a.m. on November 16, 1885, Riel was escorted from his cell. He prayed with Father André, renounced his heresies, and received absolution. When Father André began weeping, Riel said calmly, Courage, mon père. With the rope around his neck, Riel and Father André recited together the Lord's Prayer. When they reached the words, Deliver us from evil, the trap fell. The execution of Louis Riel elevated him to the status of martyr in much of Quebec. Mass rallies took place in Montreal, 
People throughout the province hung black drapes and displayed other signs of mourning. The Riel execution became a turning point in Canadian politics. Opposition to his execution helped break the conservative hold on French Canada. Riel's concerns and his passions helped define the course of Canadian history. Troubled, ever-transforming Louis Riel remained after death a large figure in the Canadian imagination. Villain or hero, a threat to orderly settlement, or a crusader against a neglectful government and greedy speculators. For many decades, French Canadians largely saw Riel as a hero. English Canadians saw him as a villain. But by the 1960s or so, the views of English Canadians drew closer to the views of French Canadians. Riel, over time, has become less linked to his actual role in history. As Canadian historian Shannon Bauer notes, various groups in Canada now seek to animate their struggles through the transcendent spirit of Louis Riel. A few takeaways for me. The testimony at the trial included assertions that Riel had passed up a $35,000 bribe to stay in Montana rather than returning to Canada. Now that was a lot of money. I could not find any further reference to this, but it was apparently used as evidence that he had to be insane to turn that offer down. In any event, this trial is arguably the most famous trial in the history of Canada. Initially, it sparked bitter divide between French and English settlers, the French viewing themselves as having been badly treated after England won control of Canada in 1763. Over the time, symbolism entered in that Riel had spoken on behalf, not of just the Mati, but for all marginalized, minimized, neglected groups, including the French. Kind of similar, I got thinking to Martin Luther King, gradually becoming the symbol of liberation for all those living under oppression and all who have a dream of freedom. Well, comments, observations, run me down. Next week, the three trials of Oscar Wilde. And as always, thanks for coming.